Blue Collar Mystics Audio presents The Kabbalion, a modern version of a spiritual classic. Written by the Three Initiates. Translated by Bootsy Greenwood. Read by the Translator. Preface. The Kabbalion is the fundamental book on Hermetic philosophy. This book explains the nature of existence in seven principles according to ancient Egyptian philosophy. This information was kept hidden and passed down throughout the ages and contains the underlying principles of truth found in all systems of thought. This information can be applied to life in a practical or magical way. This book was created based on the message inscribed on the Emerald Tablet of Thoth, or Hermes Trismegistus. Thoth is said to be an ascended master who came back to Egypt to share the secrets of the universe with civilization. Some of the most prominent thinkers and inventors credit the Emerald Tablet as the secret to their achievements, including Sir Isaac Newton, Madame Blavatsky, Fulcanelli, and many more. This mythological knowledge is the basis of hermetic law, explained by the seven hermetic axioms which describe, by nature, the operating principles of existence. These principles can be used to experience maximum fulfillment in life, make new discoveries, and attain extraordinary goals. These are the secret principles on which our world operates, and they can be applied in order to fulfill our deepest desires. The Kabbalion was written anonymously by the three initiates in the early 1900s as a book to share the secrets of the Hermetic Order. These initiates claim to be Masons of the highest degree, although they never disclose their identities. Much speculation has gone into who the actual authors of the book were, but regardless of who wrote it, this document serves to be the fundamental guide to the structure of reality as we know it. Quote, the lips of wisdom are closed, except to the ears of understanding. The Kabbalion. In the introduction to the Kabbalion, we are told that the lips of wisdom are closed, except to those who are able to listen. The Kabbalion states that its mission is not to renounce any knowledge systems or to erect a new temple, but instead to finally unite the many segments of occult knowledge scattered throughout the many traditions. Its aim is to give us a guidebook which serves as a master key to the inner door of our own soul. The authors state that the Hermetic principles are present in every tradition under the sun and that the Kabbalion is the great reconciler of these laws. The hope of the authors is to continue to keep the flame of truth passed down to the next generations, emphasizing the critical nature of keeping these ideas available while letting us know that we won't be able to receive these ideas until we are ready. The three initiates state that their purpose for writing the Kabbalion is as follows. Quote, In this little work, we have endeavored to give you an idea of the fundamental teachings of the Kabbalion, striving to give you the working principles, leaving you to apply them yourselves, rather than attempting to work out the teaching in detail. If you are a true student, you will be able to work out and apply these principles. If not, then you must develop yourself into one, for otherwise, the hermetic teachings will be as words, words, words to you. The Three Initiates My purpose in translating this work is to make an attempt to modernize the ideas and present them in an easy-to-understand and complete way, while still using the ancient terms and many of the examples from the original work in a more concise and contemporary fashion. It is my hope that these ideas become clearer to you, and I encourage you to study the manuscript itself and write your own translation of the Emerald Tablet. Mine is in the back of this book. Chapter 1. The Hermetic Philosophy Quote, 
The lips of wisdom are closed, except to the ears of understanding. The Kabbalion. From ancient Egypt come the fundamental esoteric teachings which have so strongly influenced the philosophies of every race, nation, and people for several thousand years. Egypt, home of the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx, was the birthplace of all the mystic teachings of the world. From ancient Egypt come all other religious traditions as they are all borrowed from the Egyptian masters. From India to Persia, to China, to Greece, and beyond, these ideas were spread, but all originated in Egypt. In Egypt was the great lodge of the mystics where these principles were taught. There were many masters, but among them was the great master hailed as the master of masters. This man, if he was indeed a man, was the father of occult wisdom and the founder of astrology, also the discoverer of alchemy. He was known as Hermes Trismegistus. After passing from the physical plane of life, the Egyptians deified Hermes and made him into one of their gods under the name Thoth. He was celebrated and revered, known to all as the scribe of the gods, and the Egyptians gave him the title Trismegistus, which means the thrice great, the great great, the greatest great. His name became synonymous with the fountain of wisdom. The Hermetic philosophy is the one that is sealed or hidden. This is also synonymous with esoteric or occult knowledge. The Hermetic philosophy of Hermes is the secret knowledge that is touted in masonry and mysticism and is based on these seven principles taught by Hermes. This philosophy is the foundation of all occult mysticism and illustrates the principles of Hermetic law in nature. For many years, this knowledge was kept secret or hidden, as does mean hermetically sealed. This information was banned at times throughout history, dubbed heresy or even witchcraft. This was to keep the information suppressed as the potential for people finding out about occult knowledge could easily be a threat to any authority or ruling class. Because of this, the knowledge had to be guarded and shared carefully. The hermetic knowledge is found all over the world, among all religions, but never identified with any particular religious organization. This is because of the warning of the ancient teachers against allowing the secret doctrine to become formalized into religious organizations and degenerate into superstition and empty traditions as happened to countless religions all over the world, including India, Greece, and Rome. Over the years, it has taken many masters to keep and pass down this ancient knowledge amidst the backdrop of religious persecution, alienation, and even death. There have been many great souls passing the knowledge down, and thanks to these fearless ones, we still have the truth with us. Up to the early 1900s, this information wasn't able to be printed. Instead, it was passed down from master to student, by word of mouth, for centuries. When it was written, it was often written in cryptic codes and hidden in terms of alchemy and astrology so that only those possessing the keys could decipher the meanings. In the early days, there was a compilation of certain hermetic doctrines passed on from teacher to student, which was known as the Kabbalion, though the actual meaning of this term has been lost for hundreds of years. One of the main keys of the Hermetic philosophy is that it can be used for alchemy. Alchemy is the changing of lead into gold. But the Kabbalion explains that this is an allegory for changing mental states via vibration into other mental states, not changing metals into others. The legend of the Philosopher's Stone would turn base metal into gold, but this was an allegory relating to the Hermetic philosophy and is understood by its students. By using the Hermetic Laws, the alchemist can change their circumstances in an instant with the magic of changing their mental state. In the words of the Kabbalion, quote, 
When the ears of the student are ready to hear, then cometh the lips to fill them with wisdom. The Kabbalion. According to the teachings, the passage of this book to those who are ready for its instruction will attract the attention of them who are prepared and able to receive it. Chapter 2. The Seven Hermetic Principles The Hermetic philosophy is made up of these seven principles. The principle of mentalism, the principle of correspondence, the principle of vibration, the principle of polarity, the principle of rhythm, the principle of cause and effect, and the principle of gender. Let's take a look at each one. The first hermetic principle is the principle of mentalism. As the Kabbalion says, quote, the all is mind, the universe is mental, the Kabbalion. This principle means that the universe is first a mental construct before a physical one, that the idea comes before the invention, that the beginning of anything is mind, and mind before matter as well as over matter. The mind is primary, and within infinity, all possibilities exist and must be explored on the mental plane before manifesting onto the physical. The universe is first a mental construct, and so we are primarily mental beings. If we want leverage over reality, it begins in the mind. The all, as is referred to in the Kabbalion, means the infinite the whole, the sum of everything, and is the driving force of existence. The mental world is primary, and the physical world, its effect. The principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. The Kabbalion. The second principle is the principle of correspondence. As it is in heaven, so it is in the earth. As it is in the mental plane, so it shall be made manifest in the physical. The rules of the spirit are the rules of the world. They are equal and reflect one another. As within, so without. It will always be projected in the realm of the physical as it is in the mental. There is no exception to this rule. The principle of vibration. Quote, Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. The Kabbalion. The third law is the principle of vibration. Everything is in motion. Nothing rests. The entire world is a moving picture show made up of the vibration of spirit, or the all. We see solid things in our world, but that is only because they are moving so quickly, similar to how a wheel spins but looks motionless. All manifestations of existence take the form of vibration. These vibrations are seen in reality as material objects, felt as emotion, sensed as feeling, and constantly move. Nothing ever stops moving in our world. The only constant is change. The only constant is change. The principle of polarity. Quote, everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. The Kabbalion. This fourth principle explains that everything is dual in nature. There are two sides to every coin. Electricity works with positive and negative forces, as does magnetism and attraction. Everything is dual, which really means extremes are actually the same, but differ in degree. Hot is the opposite of cold, but where does hot start and cold begin? A snowflake is cold in comparison to a raindrop, but dry ice is even colder. 
hot and cold are actually the same. They are opposites of the same thing. Examine the difference between any pair of opposites and see for yourself what is the difference between high and low, sharp and dull, fast and slow, hard and soft. It will depend on what is being compared. Because of the principle of polarity, any extreme can be flipped to its opposite through polarization and mental alchemy. The Principle of Rhythm Quote, Everything flows, out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. The Kabbalion. This principle teaches that there is always a movement to and fro, an ebb and flow for everything. That every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Everything has an inflow and an outflow, a forward and a backward. Everything moves like a pendulum. Everything moves back and forth between the poles. This is unavoidable, but can be used by the hermetic student as opposed to the student being used by this principle. The principle of cause and effect. Quote, every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. The Kabbalion. The sixth principle is the principle of cause and effect. Every cause has its effect, and every effect has a cause. This is karma. There are no uncalculated consequences. There are no coincidences. Nothing merely happens. Cause and effect is unavoidable, and we will either be at the cause or at the effect of our circumstances based on the leverage of our mental state. Understanding the principle of cause and effect allows masters to rise above the chessboard and become players of the game of life instead of being played by it. The principle of gender. The seventh principle is the principle of gender. Gender is manifested in all things. The masculine and feminine aspects are present in everything. These elements are responsible for creation. Every work of art, every flower, every single creation on the planet is made manifest by the principle of gender, and without these two elements, nothing can be made. The masculine mind and feminine spirit must work together to create anything the human being wishes, or it will not manifest just as the unpollinated flower never opens. Everyone and everything carries these polarities, and they are to be united internally in order to create. The Kabbalion specifically speaks out against any forms of lust, licentiousness, and perversion in this law. It warns that using these laws for dark purposes will have dark consequences. The baseness of other ideologies is not present in Hermeticism. Neither is black magic. Hermeticism contains nothing but the perversion of nature's principles. Quote, To the pure, all things are pure. To the base, all things are base. The Kabbalion. Chapter 3. Mental Transmutation Quote, Mind as well as metals may be transmuted from state to state, degree to degree, condition to condition, pole to pole, vibration to vibration. True hermetic transmutation is a mental art. The Kabbalion. The all is mind. The universe is mental which means that the underlying reality of the universe is mind, and the universe itself is a mental construct. This leads to the truth that if the universe is mental in nature, 
then mental transmutation is the art of changing the conditions of the universe. Mental transmutation is pure magic and is the magic that has been kept hidden within us. The art of mental transmutation is the ability to take one emotional state and change it and alchemize it into another. This ability isn't just present within each individual, but if used precisely, can also affect the mood and emotional state of many other people, even in mass. This power can be harnessed and used to make large amounts of people experience the world differently. The true hermetic student understands this impact on not only themselves, but the world around them. The universe is mental. Mind is primary, at the cause, and the material world around us is secondary, the effect. This principle is the first principle, and the Kabbalion teaches how to use this principle by explaining the other principles and their relation to this fundamental truth. The all is mind. Quote, the universe is mental. The Kabbalion. Chapter 4. The All. Quote, Under and back of, the universe of time, space, and change is ever to be found the substantial reality, the fundamental truth. The Kabbalion. The Kabbalion defines substance as, quote, That which underlies all outward manifestations, the essence, the essential reality, the thing in itself, etc. Substantial means actually existing, being in the essential element, being real, etc. Reality means the state of being real, true enduring, valid, fixed, permanent, actual, etc. The Kabbalion. Under and behind all outward appearances, there must be a substantial reality. This is the law. The Kabbalion supposes that there must be something making up the reality we all experience, that reality has to have some starting point, and that the primary principle being mental, that this must be the place to begin. In fact it is, and the fundamental reality we experience is indivisible from everything we can even begin to imagine. Infinity is a real mathematical certainty, and so, Everything must exist within the mental realm and cannot be outside of that realm. So the all is the encapsulating essence, force, reality, creator, and designer that is underlying all of existence. The all cannot be separated from itself, and therefore, it is one. It also cannot be divided from itself as it contains the energy of everything. It cannot be known in a static manner as we see the all in everything operating through constant change. Thoughts come, winds blow, flowers bloom, and leaves fall. We see the all operate in everything, but cannot experience it at its purest essence. Be certain that the all is the tie that binds all of us together and that the mental plane is infinite. The all and spirit are the same and are responsible for the manifestation of physical reality. The all is mind. The universe is mental and infinite. Everything in existence and beyond exists, and it's all connected through the spirit of the all. It's inescapable and ever-present. It is what many religions refer to as God. The Kabbalion simply refers to this force, essence, primary unit of reality as the all. The all is God, not in the deity sense, but in the sense of connective tissue or the living fundamental particle. We are each a part of the all and cannot be separated from it. The Kabbalion describes the all as the infinite living mind, which is infinite, absolute, eternal and unchangeable, the illumined 
call it spirit. Chapter 5. The Mental Universe Quote, The universe is mental, held in the mind of the all. The Kabbalion The all is beyond the universe. The universe is its manifestation. The mind is the beginning of all things and precludes matter. It is the all or spirit manifested in the form of reality. These rules are the basis of the fabric of reality and reflect the infinite living mind of the all in existence. The mind is the real essence, that which is the creator and created, that which is the all and from the all. Let us distinguish between substance and form here. Substance makes up the form at its essence, but is not the form itself. It precludes form and is the beginning of all things beyond the universe, also known as the all or spirit, which is constantly changing from substance into form, manifesting in every moment the expression of the all. Quote, the infinite mind of the all is the womb of universes. The Kabbalion. All is mind and must come from mind. The all manifests because of the principle of gender, the two elements of creation, which are masculine and feminine. All things are crafted from the womb of the feminine with the impression of the masculine principle. This is the example of the principle of polarity in action. The womb of the mind of Mother Nature must commune with the will of the Father, which are one, but also separate. These principles are separate in the way your own consciousness is separate. The Kabbalion explains that we all have two aspects of consciousness, the I and the me, the observing mind and the thinking mind. Quote, as above, so below. Our consciousness has masculine and feminine aspects just as the higher conscious order. These aspects of consciousness will be further described later in detail. In order to ascend into higher consciousness, it is essential to be aware of these two parts of the self and learn to differentiate them. This is the first key to alchemy. Begin to become aware of the thinker and the experiencer. Begin to differentiate the I from the me. You are one. You are both the I and me. But these awarenesses are also different, just like the higher consciousness of the all. Quote, as above, so below. The law is reflected in the individual as it is in the collective. Understanding this law can be a key to unlocking greater awareness and be employed to solve the riddles of higher and lower planes. The Kabbalion reminds us that the reason why we have instinctive reverence for the all in the form of nature and spiritual practices. The universe is so much greater than we can ever know. The earth is but a speck of dust in the universe, and a speck of dust is the universe itself as well. There are millions and millions of worlds, and everything you can imagine is already real in the mind of the all. It is also unreal. Everything is real, and nothing is real. The Kabbalion says that even death is not real. It is just a passing into another state, a birth to a new life, and life will go on and on until it resolves back into one when we will know the truth and the whole truth of being once again. This is reported by the Ascended Masters. In the meantime, rest calmly as you are divinely protected by the universal mother and father mind, that of the all. Everything is unfolding in accordance with the will of the all. Quote, within father and mother mind, all children are at home. The Kabbalion. Quote, 
There is no one who is fatherless or motherless in the universe. The Kabbalion. Chapter 6, The Divine Paradox Quote, The half-wise, recognizing the comparative unreality of the universe, imagine that they may defy its laws. Such are vain and presumptuous fools, and they are broken against the rocks and torn asunder by the elements by reason of their folly. The truly wise, knowing the nature of the universe, use law against laws, the higher against the lower, and by the art of alchemy transmute that which is undesirable into that which is worthy and triumph. Mastery consists not in abnormal dreams, visions, and fantastic imaginings or living, but in using the higher forces against the lower, escaping the pains of the lower planes by vibrating on the higher. Transmutation, not presumptuous denial, is the weapon of the master. The Kabbalion. This is the paradox of the universe. The universe is and is not. Everything is infinite, so everything already exists, but the material world is finite and must be treated as real. The reality we experience is just like a dream, and depending on the perspective, it takes on a completely different meaning. The all is the objective mind and encompasses all. Each of us is subjectively experiencing some portion of the great infinite mind individually, basically living out one of its infinite dreams. The Kabbalion warns, quote, Do not be like the half-wise who perish for their folly. Be the truly wise by understanding the paradox and transmuting lower states of consciousness into higher ones. That is true alchemy and allows the student to ascend up the planes and begin to use higher laws against lower ones. The Kabbalion. The half-wise only understand a portion of its truth, that all truths are half-truths. The universe is and is not at the same time. The material universe is as real or unreal as an individual's dream and is a speck in the mind of the all. But our experiences and circumstances are also very real. Absolute versus relative truth. Absolute truth is the truth of the all. It is objective and unwavering, but impossible to understand from our limited relative perspective in which we see through our own subjective experience. To illustrate this idea, the Kabbalion uses the example of modern science and addresses its limits. The Kabbalion says that it is a fact that matter exists to our senses and admits that we will have a hard time with reality if we don't acknowledge this truth. But it also points out that matter is simply an aggregation of atoms vibrating in constant and circular motion. For example, if we kick a stone and feel the impact on our foot, which senses through our brains. This action seems to be real. But our foot is also matter, and so is our brain. And if it weren't for our mind, we wouldn't have any knowledge of the foot or the stone at all. Thus, all is illusion, and life is but a dream, yet also very real to us. In order to progress into higher and higher states, we need to understand the mental laws and apply them in order to climb higher in the scale of mentality towards the all. The laws of the universe are ironclad and do not have exceptions except by the all itself, which is not limited to law, but set the laws in place which everything in the universe is subject to. The purpose of this lesson is to make the student completely aware that the universe and its phenomena are just as real as they would be under the hypotheses of materialism or energism, and that the primary law of the universe is mentalism, that the universe is first mental, and that is the ultimate highest plane of existence for which all laws flow from. Understand the law of mentalism and use it to apply the laws of the Kabbalion, 
But do not be swayed into the temptation to be like the half-wise and ignore either of these half-truths. Those who do are often hypnotized by the apparent unreality of things and become solipsists, like dream people dwelling in an unreal world, ending up as broken against the rocks and torn asunder by the elements by reason of their folly. Instead, be wise and follow the example of the masters in order to transmute that which is undesirable into that which is worthy and triumphant. We do not live simply in a world of dreams, but in a universe which is real so far as our lives and actions are concerned. Our actions do have consequences as the law of cause and effect states. It is up to us to balance these half-truths of absolute and relative truth and begin to leverage them to climb higher ever into that universal, infinite mind. The true meaning of life is not known to anyone on this plane, but we are all on the path towards union with the one universal and infinite mind, and the road leads upward only with frequent resting places. Carefully consider this lesson and follow the example of the wise, avoiding the mistakes of the half-wise who perish by reason of folly. Chapter 7 the all in all. Quote, while all is in the all, it is equally true that the all is in all. To them who truly understand this hath come great knowledge. The Kabbalion. How often have we all heard the statement that whatever deity we call God is the all in all? And how often have we considered the occult truth in this idea? The expression is originally derived from the great occult teaching of Hermes Trismegistus and was simply applied to many religious and dogmatic traditions as the Hermetic axiom contains one of the greatest philosophical, scientific, and religious truths. In the previous chapter was discussed the truth that the universe is mental and held in the mind of the all. Here we begin to explore and uncover the other side of this truth that the all is also in all. It is equally true that the all is in all and that all can be found in the all. This apparent contradiction is reconciled with the law of paradox. Not only is all contained within the all, but the essence of the all itself is also found in all things. Quote, the Hermetic teachings illustrate that the all is immanent in its universe and every part, particle, unit, or combination within the universe. The Kabbalion. This idea is generally expressed by teachers by referencing the law of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. To illustrate this idea, the teacher instructs a student to visualize something, to create a mental image a person, an idea, or an object, the usual being a dramatist forming an idea of their characters, or a painter or sculptor framing an image of an ideal they want to convey with their art. In each case, the student will find that while the image has its existence and being solely within their own mind, they also remain within that creation. In other words, the creation is transmuted from the mind of the creator of a work into the work itself. To take an example, imagine that one of Shakespeare's characters existed merely in the mind of Shakespeare. Although Shakespeare also exists within each one of the characters, giving them their personality, spirit, and characteristics. Whose is the spirit of the characters we have known? Is it the spirit of the writer or of the character itself? Does Michelangelo's David exhibit the spirit of Michelangelo or does it contain its own? The law of paradox explains that both propositions are actually true, that Michelangelo's David is its own creation but contains the spirit of Michelangelo as well. The characters created by artists are a part of each creator but also their own creations. 
so it is with each of us, with everything in existence. While we are all our own, we also contain a part of the all, as does everything in existence. The character is a part of the creator, but the character is not identical to the creator. This idea may lead us to the realization that, quote, the spirit of my creator is inherent within me, and yet I am not the creator. This is a much different idea than the idea that the character itself is God. Imagine one of Shakespeare's characters claiming to be Shakespeare himself. The all is in the earthworm, but the earthworm is not the all. But the all is imminent in the earthworm and in the particles that make up the earthworm. Can there be a greater mystery than this of all in the all and the all in all? The examples given are elementary but illustrative and carry with them a distinguishing nuance between creator and creation. They represent the mental images in finite minds, while the universe is a creation of infinite mind, and the difference in degree separates these ideas. Quote, as above, so below. There are many planes of being and subplanes of life. There are levels upon levels in the infinite mind, which are separated by degree. The Hermetic teachings teach the process of creation and demonstrate the creative cycle, which is scalar, and illustrates the advancement of beings in the scale of existence from the lowest to the highest. This is the scale of life and ultimately ends in a resolution with the all. All progress is returning home, even if it may not seem like it. All movement is upward and onward toward the highest union of the all. All movement is progress, even though it may seem contradictory in appearance. The Hermetic teachings identify the creative cycle as the movement of the universe towards oneness and harmony. The all exists in its aspect of simply being, projects its will toward its aspect of becoming, and the process of creation begins. The process is taught that creation consists of the lowering of vibration until a form is manifested. This describes the process where ideas in higher planes slowly become manifested from the infinite mind to the finite realm. This process is called the state of involution, where the all becomes involved or wrapped up in its creation. This is believed by Hermeticists to have a correspondence to the mental process of the writer, sculptor, painter, or inventor who becomes so wrapped up in their creation as to almost forget their own existence and who, for the time being, lives in their own created universe. This is sometimes referred to as an outpouring of divine energy and the evolutionary stage is regarded as the beginning of the return swing of the pendulum of rhythm, known as the indrawing, a coming home or a return to one. The outpouring and the indrawing are both creative forces which only differ in degree on the scale of creation. These two elements, one breaking apart and one joining, are actively working together in order to unite the all with itself. The breaking apart and the joining are actually one and the same. This is the process of creation as outlined by the Kabbalion. The ancient Hermeticists used the word meditation to describe the process of the mental creation of the universe in the mind of the all, with the word contemplation also being used. But the idea intended seems to be the employment of divine attention. Attention is a word that means to reach out, and the act of attention is really a reaching out of mental energy. That is the more accurate word for the process and is the primary force of creation. As the all established the material foundations for existence and allowed for evolution through its meditation, having thought the world into existence, the all placed the parameters for its movement in order so that the process of evolution could flow properly on the material and spiritual planes successively 
and in order. So the upward movement begins and ultimately resolves in union with all spirit. In time, matter becomes less dense and begins to vibrate in higher and higher forms as part of the indrawing process. All this occupies eons and lasts millions and millions of years, yet the masters teach us that the universe itself is but the twinkle of an eye to the all. At the end of countless eons and cycles of time, the all withdraws its attention, its contemplation and meditation from the universe, and the great work is finished. Then, all is withdrawn into the all from which it emerged. But the spirit of each soul is not destroyed, but infinitely expanded. The created and the creator merge. Just as this process occurs by the all, we can witness it individually as well as we cease from existing on the physical plane and withdraw ourselves through death into the indwelling spirit, also known as the divine ego. Many have asked why the all creates universes, and there has been much speculation on the particular question. Many believe that the all found itself compelled to create out of loneliness or out of a desire for something to love. Others claim that it is merely the nature of the universe to create. There seems to be no reason, and when Hermes was asked, he simply closed his lips, demonstrating the axiom that the lips of wisdom are closed, except to those with the ears of understanding. There seems to be no clear reason why the all behaves in such a manner, as that would imply a cause to which the all is above the law of cause and effect. The matter is unthinkable, just as the all is unknowable, just as we say the all merely is. So there is no other answer than to say that the all acts because it acts. If Hermes knew the secret, he failed to share it. This is an unanswerable question, but whatever the answer to the problem, if there is an answer, the truth remains that, quote, while all is in the all, it is equally true that the all is in all. The Kabbalion. Quote, to him who understands this truth hath come great knowledge. The Kabbalion. Chapter 8. Planes of Correspondence. Quote, as above, so below. As below, so above. The Kabbalion. The second hermetic principle embodies the truth that there is harmony, agreement, and correspondence between the several planes of manifestation, life, and being. Every plane reflects every other plane, and all planes are subject to the law. This is true because the universe emanates from a single source, and the laws and principles follow its law on every plane of existence. The Kabbalion divides the planes of existence into three main classes. One, the great physical plane. Two, the great mental plane. And three, the great spiritual plane. The divisions are more or less arbitrary, but they are simply degrees of the infinite mind on the scale of life. The lowest point is undifferentiated matter, and the highest point is spirit itself. The Kabbalion also notes that these planes spill over into one another and are difficult to truly separate as they are all connected and linked on the scale, no matter the degree. The three great planes may be regarded as the three groups of degrees of life manifestation. These three planes make up the three dimensions as we know them and can be measured to a certain extent, but not definitively. These planes are not places or states or conditions, but classifications which do not have specific boundaries. But there is another dimension as well, which is known as the fourth dimension, which is beyond the three standard dimensions listed above. This fourth dimension may be considered the dimension of vibration. This space is not a place, but exemplifies the third hermetic principle of vibration that everything vibrates. Everything is in motion. Nothing is at rest. The Kabbalion. 
From the highest manifestation to the lowest, all things vibrate. They all vibrate at different rates of motion and only differ in degree and manner of vibration. The higher the plane, the higher the degree of vibration, and the higher the manifestation of life occupying that plane. While any of these planes are not places, so to speak, they are really not states or conditions either, though they do possess qualities common to places, states, or conditions. Remember that the three great planes are not actually divisions of the universe, but simply terms used by Hermeticists to help understand the concepts of the Kabbalion. Everything in existence is on the scale, which makes everything the same in essence, with the only difference being a matter of degree and a rate of vibration. All is created by the all and exists within the infinite mind of the all. The three great planes are further subdivided into seven minor planes, and each of those are also subdivided into seven subplanes. These divisions are more or less arbitrary, but give the student a starting point for the convenience of study and thought. The great physical plane, with its seven minor physical planes, is the division of the phenomena of the universe, which includes everything related to physics, material objects, forces, and manifestations. It includes all forms of that which we call matter and all forms of energy or force. Hermetic philosophy does not recognize matter as a thing in itself or as having a separate existence even in the mind of the all. The Kabbalion teaches that matter is but a form of energy at a lower rate of vibration. The seven minor physical planes are 1. The plane of matter A 2 the plane of matter B, 3, the plane of matter C, 4, the plane of ethereal substance, 5, the plane of energy A, 6, the plane of energy B, 7, the plane of energy C. The plane of matter A makes up the forms of matter as solids, liquids, and gases. The plane of matter B refers to certain higher and more subtle forms of matter, which are known as subatomic particles. The plane of matter C refers to forms of the most subtle and unsubstantial matter, which is unknown to science. The plane of ethereal substance might be called the ether, or kether, which is a subtle, elastic sort of substance saturating the universal space and acting as a medium for the transmission of waves of energy such as light, heat, and electricity. This ethereal substance connects and links matter and energy and takes on the nature of each. The Hermetic teachings teach that the plane of ethereal substance has seven subdivisions or minor planes as well, and that there are in fact seven ethers, not just one. Above the plane of ethereal substance comes the plane of energy A, which is composed of the ordinary forms of energy known to science, including light, heat, magnetism, gravitation, attraction, cohesion, and chemical affinity. The plane of energy B is made up of seven subplanes of higher forms of energy not yet discovered by science, but have been named nature's finer forces, and which are known by hermeticists to be the operations of certain forms of mental phenomena. The plane of energy C is made up of seven subplanes of energy so highly organized that it bears many of the characteristics of life, but is not recognized by the minds of human beings and is only available on the spiritual plane. Such energy is inconceivable to people and may be called the divine power. The beings employing this type of energy are gods compared to even the highest human types known to us. The great mental plane is made of those forms of living beings known to us in ordinary life, as well as other forms only known to the Hermeticists. The classifications of the seven minor mental planes is more or less arbitrary, but will be mentioned here as well. The seven minor mental planes are 1. The plane of mineral mind 2. The plane of elemental mind A 3. The plane of plant mind 4. The plane of elemental mind B 5. The plane of animal mind 6. The plane of elemental mind C 7. The plane of human mind these planes or states of consciousness represent living energy in many varied states of awareness which differ in degree. 
The plane of mineral mind refers to the state of which mineral life are animated and aware. These may be called souls in one sense, but are small units of living energy, which make up the higher subdivisions of the highest physical plane. The average person does not attribute possession of mind, soul, or life to the mineral kingdom, but hermeticists do. The plane of elemental mind A makes up the state or condition of a class of entities unknown to the average person. Their degree of intelligence is between that of the mineral and chemical entities on the one hand and of the entities of the plant and animal kingdom on the other. The plane of plant mind is made up of the entities occupying the kingdoms of the plant world and refers to the intelligence of plant life, which has been scientifically recorded and confirmed since the 1980s. The plane of elemental mind B refers to the states and conditions of a higher form of elemental or unseen entities. These form a scale between the plane of plant mind and the plane of animal mind. These entities operate in and between both. The plane of animal mind refers to the states and conditions of the entities, beings, or souls animating in the animal forms of life. The plane of elemental mind C is made up of entities which partake of the nature of both animal and human life in degree and in certain combinations. The highest forms are semi-human in intelligence. The plane of human mind contains the manifestations of life and mentality which are common to humanity in our various grades, degrees, and divisions. The Kabbalion suggests that the ordinary human being of today occupies the fourth subdivision of the plane of human mind, and only the most intelligent have crossed into the fifth. It has taken humanity millions of years to reach this stage, and will likely take millions more to reach the sixth and seventh plane. Our species has only raised to the fifth level so far with stragglers from the fourth. Those who reach the sixth will be known as Superman, and the seventh known as the Overman. The Kabbalion considers the seven minor mental planes to be incredibly difficult to describe, and says that the elemental planes have the same relation to the planes of mineral, plant, animal, and human mentality and life that the black keys on the piano do to the white keys. The white keys are sufficient to play music, but there are certain scales, harmonies, and melodies in which the black keys play their part and in which their presence is necessary. They are also necessary between the several other planes to connect in between planes and read between the lines, so to speak. The Kabbalion says that the elemental beings are recognized by all hermeticists, and the esoteric writings are full of mention of them. The Kabbalion specifically points out an old tale called Zanoni by Edward Bulwer Latone, which is a Rosicrucian tale as one of many books which will point to the existence of these elemental entities inhabiting these planes' existence. The Kabbalion doesn't dare to explain the spiritual planes, as it is beyond the scope of the book. There is no way to properly explain these ideas, and so further study will be required to grasp the spiritual planes. On these higher spiritual planes of existence is where we find beings called angels, archangels, and demigods. And on the lower, minor spiritual planes dwell many of the great masters and adepts. Above them all are the beings which may be referred to as the gods who are so high in the scale they are beyond the human capacity to understand or imagine. These unseen divinities extend their influence freely and powerfully in the process of evolution and cosmic progress. Their occasional intervention and assistance in human affairs have led to many legends, beliefs, religions, and traditions of the race past and present. They have superimposed their knowledge and power upon the world again and again, all under the law of the all, of course. Even the highest of these advanced beings exists merely in the mind of the all and are still subject to the cosmic processes and universal laws. They are still mortal. We may call them gods if we like, but they are still not as high as the absolute on the scale. The highest of all is that of the absolute spirit. 
Only the most advanced hermeticists are able to grasp the inner teachings about the state of existence and the powers manifested on the spiritual planes. The phenomena is so much higher than the mental planes that confusion would be created by attempting to explain. Only those who have been trained and studied the hermetic philosophy for many years can comprehend what is even meant by the teachings regarding the spiritual planes. The hermeticists offer a word of clarification and warning that many of these ideas are powerful and could become dangerous in the wrong hands. The information shared can be used for good or evil, as is denoted by many religious teachings and the principle of polarity. When the hermeticists use the word spirit, it is in the sense of living power, animated power, mystic force, or the animating principle, and is not to be confused with any major religion. The writers make it clear that misuse of these principles will end in a terrible fate for anyone who does decide to misuse them. The legends of fallen angels are based fact. The string for selfish power on the spiritual planes inevitably results in the selfish soul losing its spiritual balance and falling back as far as it had previously risen. The principle of correspondence embodies the truth, as above, so below, as below, so above. The seven hermetic principles are in full operation on all the many planes, physical, mental, and spiritual. The principle of correspondence manifests in all planes as there is a correspondence, harmony, and agreement between all the planes. The principle of correspondence embodies one of the great principles of natural law. As we proceed with our consideration of the remaining principles, we will see even more clearly the nature of this great principle of correspondence. Chapter 9. Vibration. Quote, Nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. The Kabbalion. The third hermetic principle is the principle of vibration. This means that motion is manifest in everything in the universe, that everything moves, vibrates, and circles. This law was recognized by many of the early Greek philosophers, but was lost sight of for centuries except for the hermeticists. In the 19th century, science rediscovered this principle, and we currently have many models displaying this idea in modern physics. This law explains that everything vibrates, and the only difference between objects is a change in their vibrational frequency. What we call matter and energy are simply modes of vibration, and this has been displayed through several experiments in modern science. Science teaches us that all matter manifests from the vibrations arising from temperature, or heat, and that all atoms move in a circular movement, with protons and electrons around the nucleus or center. These particles make up the forms of matter we see and experience with our senses because of the principle of vibration. It is the same with all other forms of energy. Light, heat, magnetism, and electricity are forms of vibratory motion connected with and emanating from the ether. Science doesn't yet explain cohesion or molecular attraction, chemical affinity, or gravitation but the hermeticists understand these as manifestations of some form of vibratory motion and have for many ages. The universal ether is thought to be a higher manifestation of that which is called matter, or matter at a higher form of vibration. Science teaches us that this is the ethereal substance. The hermeticists teach that this ethereal substance acts as a medium of transmission of waves and vibrations, and is a connecting link between the forms of vibratory energy known as matter or energy. The hermeticists say that this substance also manifests a degree of vibration in a rate and mode entirely its own. The Kabbalion illustrates two examples of vibration in the form of sound and color. There are many vibrations which cannot be experienced by human senses. The color spectrum is far beyond what we can see, and sound vibration can only be experienced to a degree. The authors use an example of a very low sound that's vibration is gradually increased. 
As it rises, the sound vibrates one note higher in the musical scale. Then, once it increases again, it reaches up to another note higher and higher until the sound becomes so high that the final note can't be heard with the human ear, and the shrill, piercing shriek becomes inaudible. As we follow the visual color spectrum, the vibrations go up through the scale and we can actually watch the colors change. We experience the spectrum starting with low red into orange, then yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet as the rate of speed increases. Eventually, the vibrations speed up so much that we can't see them and become X-rays, gamma rays, etc. Science theorizes that once the object reaches a certain rate of vibration, its molecules disintegrate and break apart. Hermeticists teach that if the vibrations were continually increased, the object would eventually climb the successive planes of correspondence and would enter the mental stages and on up spiritward, finally re-entering the all in absolute spirit. Of course, the object would have ceased to be an object long before entering the mental plane, but would ultimately climb all the planes and eventually resolve into the absolute mind. Fortunately, the hermetic teachings go much further than science and give us insight into ourselves as well as the material world. Hermetics teaches us that all manifestation of thought, including emotion, reason, will, desire, and any mental state or condition, is always accompanied by vibrations, a portion of which are projected and which tend to affect the minds of other people by induction or transference. This idea is what produces the phenomena of telepathy, mental influence, persuasion, propaganda, and the power of mind over mind. Every thought, emotion, or mental state has its corresponding rate and mode of vibration, and by using the power of the masculine principle of will, these mental states can be reproduced intentionally. These mental states can be projected in mass to other people through vibration, as can be witnessed in large crowds and through mass media. Every thought, emotional, or mental state has its corresponding rate and mode of vibration. By the effort of the will, these states may be reproduced like a musical note on an instrument that vibrates at a certain rate, just as color may be reproduced in the same way. By using the principle of vibration applied to mental phenomena, one may polarize their mind to any degree they wish, gaining perfect control over their mental state or mood. By understanding this principle and affecting the mood of one's self, the hermeticist will understand that they also influence the moods of others and can create desired states in them. The student who understands this principle will be able to create on the mental plane that which science can only on the physical and employ what the hermeticists call vibration at will. The tools of this can only be acquired through the necessary disciplines of mental transmutation, which is one of the branches of the hermetic art. Through the principle of vibration, the mystery of the most wonderful phenomena in the universe can be grasped. Through this law, the masters and adepts appeared able to set aside laws of nature, but instead were using one law against another, one principle against others, and performed what appeared to be miracles. As the Kabbalion has said, quote, He who understands the principle of vibration has grasped the scepter of power. The Kabbalion. Chapter 10. Polarity. Quote, everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. The Kabbalion. The fourth hermetic principle is the principle of polarity. This law expresses the truth that everything is dual in nature, that all things have two sides, two aspects, two poles, a pair of opposites with many 
differing degrees between the two extremes. All paradoxes, old and new, can be resolved with this idea which has confounded the minds of human beings for so long that certain sayings have become embedded in our psyches, such as, everything is and isn't, there are two sides to everything, and every truth is half false, and so on. The Kabbalion teaches that things seemingly in opposition are in fact only really different in degree meaning they are two opposites of the same thing and can be reconciled as such. The Kabbalion states that thesis and antithesis are identical in nature, but different in degree, and that the universal reconciliation of opposites is catalyzed by recognizing this principle of polarity. The teachers begin to illustrate this idea by showing that spirit and matter are but two poles of the same thing, the mind and the physical. They show that the all and the many are the same, the difference only being in the degree of mental manifestation. To take a physical example, the Kabbalion demonstrates by showing that heat and cold are identical in nature, but different in degree. Something can only be cold in relation to anything that is hotter than that which is cold. The higher of the degrees is always warmer and the colder lower. There is no place on a thermometer where heat begins and cold ends. The idea of what is hot and what is cold fluctuates and isn't static. It is always changing based on the degree in the scale. The very terms high and low, which are used compellingly by the authors, are both opposites of the same thing. The terms themselves are all relative. The same with east and west. Travel far enough east and you'll be headed west. Travel far enough north and eventually you'll be headed south. Light and dark are poles of the same thing, with many degrees between them. The musical scale is the same. You start with C and move up to yet another C, and so on. The same is true with loud and quiet, hard and soft, sharp and dull. Positive and negative are two poles of the same thing with countless degrees between them. Good and bad are not absolute. We call one end of the scale good and the other bad. One end good and the other evil, according to the use of the terms. But one thing is more good than a thing less high in the scale and less good than something else higher in the scale. The more or less being regulated only by the position on the scale relative to something else. And so it is on the mental plane. Love and hate are generally considered diametrically opposed to each other, but they are merely two poles of the same energy as there is no such thing as absolute love or absolute hate. We simply see more or less hate in the scale no matter from what point we start. There are degrees of love and hate, and there is a middle point where like and dislike become so similar that it is difficult to distinguish between them. Courage and fear come under the same rule. The pairs of opposites are everywhere. Wherever you find a thing, you will find its opposite. And it is because of this fact that the hermeticist can transmute one mental state into another with the use of polarization. Things belonging to different classes can't be transmuted into each other, but anything that is of the same class may be changed. It may have its polarity flipped. So love can't become east or west, red or violet, but it can and often does turn into hate. And likewise, hate may be transformed into love by changing its polarity. Courage can be transmuted into fear and fear into courage. Hard things can become soft, Dull things can become sharp, and hot things can become cold. The transmutation is taking things of the same kind to different degrees, switching the polarity of the same thing to the same thing on the other side of the scale. The student will recognize that in the mental states, the two poles may be classified as positive and negative, respectively. So love is positive compared to hate, and courage is positive compared to fear. Activity is positive to non-activity, etc. Many will notice that the positive pole seems to be of a higher degree than the negative and easily dominates it, 
This is because the tendency of nature is in the direction of the dominant activity of the positive pole. The universe is moving towards the mental and vibrating higher and higher, so the tendency is toward the positive by default. In addition to changing one's own mental states by the art of polarization, we may once again mention that the principle may be extended to influence the minds of others through induction and transference. By simply harnessing the principle of polarity, the student can influence their own mental state and the states of others. A knowledge of this great hermetic principle will enable the student to better understand their own mental states and those of other people. They will understand that their states are merely a matter of degree and will be able to raise or lower their vibration at will in order to master their mental state instead of being its slave. With this knowledge, the student can also aid others by changing the polarity in them when it is desirable. The Kabbalion urges the student to familiarize themselves with the principle of polarity, for a correct understanding of it will throw a light on many subjects. Chapter 11. Rhythm. Quote, Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. The Kabbalion. The fifth hermetic principle the principle of rhythm explains the truth that everything is manifested in a measured motion, a to and from movement, an ebb and flow, a swing backward and forward, a pendulum-like movement, a high tide and a low tide. Between the two poles manifest on the physical, mental, or spiritual planes. The principle of rhythm is closely related to the principle of polarity but it doesn't mean that the swing of the rhythm swings to the extreme. In most cases, it doesn't, but it does swing toward one pole and then to the other. There is always an action and reaction, an advance and retreat, attack and release, a rising and a sinking manifested in all the phenomena of the universe. Everything in the universe manifests this principle from the sun to the moon to the ocean, plants, animals, and human beings. Even spirit manifests this principle. It's present in the creation and destruction of worlds, the rise and fall of nations, and the history of all things, as well as in the mental states of human beings. Starting with the manifestations of spirit, the all, we will notice that there is always present the outpouring and the indrawing of breath the out-breathing and in-breathing of Brahm, as the Brahmins word it. Universes are created, reach their extreme low point of materiality, and then begin their upward swing. Suns spring into being, and once their height of power is reached, they begin their decline, and after eons they become dead masses of matter, waiting on another impulse to start this cycle over again. All worlds are born grow, and die, only to be reborn. This is the principle in action in all things as they swing from activity to inactivity and then back again. We can see this principle demonstrated in trends, fashion, movements, governments, empires, and everything else. The pattern goes like this. Birth, growth, maturity, decadence, death, and then new birth. Night follows day, and day follows night. The pendulum swings to summer, then winter, and then back again. All mass swings around the center of its nature. There is no such thing as absolute rest or cessation of movement, and everything moves in rhythm. The universal pendulum is ever in motion. The tides of life flow in and out, according to law. The principle of rhythm is well understood by science, but the Hermeticists take the law much further. 
They know its manifestations and influence extend to the mental activities of human beings individually and in groups. By studying the operations of this principle, students can escape some of the trapping activities of rhythm by transmutation. The Hermetic Masters discovered a long time ago that the principle of rhythm was invariable and could not be stopped. They also discovered that there were two planes of consciousness, the lower and the higher. And understanding this fact enabled them to rise to the higher plane and escape the swing of the rhythmic pendulum, which was manifested on the lower plane. To put it another way, the swing of the pendulum occurred on the unconscious plane, and consciousness was not affected. This is what the masters call the law of neutralization. To be aware in the higher plane puts the student above the lower effects from the swing of the pendulum. It is like rising above something and letting it pass beneath you. The hermetic master or advanced student polarizes themselves at the desired pole and holds their charge by not participating in the backwards swing. Here, the student effectively denies the influence over themselves, rising above the unconscious and consciously choosing their position. All who have attained any degree of self-mastery accomplish this, often unknowingly, by refusing to allow their moods and mental states to affect them. They apply the law of neutralization and are unaffected by the pendulum swing. The master carries this even further and by use of will attains a degree of poise almost impossible to believe by anyone who allows themselves to become susceptible to the swing of pendulums of moods and feelings. The power of this method will be appreciated by anyone who realizes just what creatures of moods, feelings, and emotion the majority of people are, and how little mastery they have over themselves. Stop and think for a moment how these swings of rhythm have affected you in your life. The power of this principle cannot be overstated. To illustrate this principle, think about how a period of enthusiasm led to an opposite feeling of depression or burnout. Just like moods and periods of courage have been succeeded by equal moods of fear. This is how it is with most people. Tides of feeling have risen and fallen in them, but they have never suspected that it is due to the reason of law. An understanding of this law will give one the key to mastering these rhythmic swings of feeling and allow them to know and understand themselves better by paying attention to the inflow and outflow of emotional moods. The will is superior to the manifestation of this principle, but the principle itself cannot be destroyed. It can be harnessed and leveraged so we can escape some of its effects, but the pendulum still swings, though we can escape being carried along with it. There are other features of this law of rhythm which have been noted by others. One main feature is that of compensation. To compensate means to counterbalance, and this illustrates that the measure of the swing to the left is equal to the measure of the swing to the right. Rhythm compensates. The law of compensation means that the swing in one direction determines the swing in the other. The pole balances to the other side in the same amount. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. An object thrown into the sky travels the same distance upward as it will when it comes back down. This is a constant law on the physical plane, but the Hermeticists take it even further. They teach that mental states are subject to the same law. The person who enjoys intensely is subject to greater suffering, while the one who feels little pain is only capable of feeling little joy. The pig suffers little and enjoys little. It is compensated. And on the other hand, there are animals who enjoy eagerly, but whose nervous temperament caused them to suffer exquisite degrees of pain, and so it is with human beings. Those who have low threshold of enjoyment have low degrees of suffering. Those who have the most intense enjoyment also bear the hardest suffering. This law states that the capacity for pain and pleasure in each individual are balanced. This is the law of compensation in action. The Hermetic Masters take this principle even further still and add that before one is able to enjoy a certain degree of pleasure, they must have swung as far proportionately 
toward the other pole of feeling. They declare that the negative precedes the positive in this matter, that the pleasure is the rhythmic swing for a degree of pain previously experienced in the present life or in a previous carnation. This creates a complicated light on the issue of pain. The Hermeticists regard the chain of lives as continuous and as forming a part of one life of the individual, so that in consequence the rhythmic swing is understood in this way, while it would be without meaning unless the truth of reincarnation is admitted. However, the Kabbalion also states that the master or advanced student is able, to a great degree, to escape the swing toward pain by the process of neutralization mentioned earlier. By rising on to the higher planes of consciousness, much of the experience that comes to those dwelling in the lower plane is avoided and escaped. The law of compensation plays an important part in the lives of human beings. It will be noticed that one generally pays the price for anything they have or lack. If a person has one thing, they will lack another. A balance is struck. No one can keep the penny and have the bit of cake. The things we have are always paid for by the things we lose. The rich possess many things that the poor lack, while the poor often possess things that are beyond the reach of the rich. The millionaire may have the ability to feast since they are wealthy, but often lack the appetite to enjoy it. The blue-collar worker who lacks wealth gets more pleasure from his plain food than the millionaire could ever obtain even if his appetite weren't jaded or his digestion ruined. The law of compensation is ever in operation, striving to balance and counterbalance and always succeeding in time, even though several lives may be required for the return swing of the pendulum of rhythm. Chapter 12. Causation. Quote, Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law unrecognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. The Kabbalion. The sixth hermetic principle is the law of cause and effect. This law states that nothing happens according to chance, that chance is merely a term for a cause unnoticed. The law also states that causal chains of events are continuous without break or exception. The principle of cause and effect is found in all scientific thought, ancient and modern, and was heralded by the Hermetic teachers in the earliest days. The principle of cause and effect has been accepted as correct by practically all the greatest thinkers of the world. To think otherwise would be to take all the events of the universe from the domain of law and order and relegate them entirely to chance. A little consideration will show anyone that there is no such thing as pure chance. The word chance is defined as, quote, a supposed agent or mode of activity other than the supposed effect of such an agent, a happening, fortuity, casualty, etc., end quote. But there can be no such agent as chance in the sense of something outside the law, outside cause and effect. How could anything operate in the phenomenal universe independent of its laws? Nothing outside of the all is outside the law because the all is the law in itself. There is no room in the universe for a something outside of and independent of law. The existence of such a something would render all the natural laws ineffective and would plunge the universe into chaotic disorder. A careful examination of what we call chance will reveal it to be a happening with obscure causes. It is a term used to describe an effect for which we don't understand the cause. Many effects may have multiple causes and many of those causes may remain unknown, but rest assured The causes are there, underlying the effects. There couldn't be an effect without them. Just because all of the causes cannot be accounted for doesn't mean there is no cause. 
People have become confused about this law because they have misunderstood it to say that one thing could cause another thing. As a matter of fact, no thing ever causes or creates any other thing. Cause and effect deals merely with events. An event is defined as that which comes, arrives, or happens as a result or consequence of some preceding event. No event creates another event, but is merely a preceding link in the great orderly chain of events flowing from the creative energy of the all. There is a continuity between all events past, present, and future. They are linked through a relation existing between everything that has gone before and everything that follows. A stone is dislodged from a mountainside and crashes through the roof of a cottage below. At first sight, we regard this as a chance effect, but when we examine the matter, we find a great chain of causes behind it. First there was the rain that softened the earth under the stone and allowed it to fall. Then behind that was the influence of the sun, other rains, winds, and impact on the stone, which gradually eroded the piece of rock from a larger piece. Then there were the causes which led to the formation of the mountain and on and on into infinity. Even something as mundane as a speck of soot in your eye goes back to the early part of the world's history. That speck was once an oak and became charcoal and has passed through many iterations and causes to wind up there and may cause many more events as a result. It's possible that the bit of soot was once found in the writing of these lines, which caused the typesetter to perform certain work, the proofreader to do likewise, and the synthesizer to highlight this particular idea, which will create certain thoughts in your mind, which will in turn cause others, and so on, all because a tiny bit of soot. This shows the connection and association of things and proves the truth, quote, there is no great, there is no small, in the mind that causeth all. The Kabbalion. Stop to think a moment. If a certain man had not met a certain woman many years ago, back in the Stone Age, you wouldn't be reading these lines right now. And if perhaps the same couple had failed to meet, the authors of this book might not exist, and these lines themselves would not be. Quote, Every thought we think, Every act we perform has its direct and inert results which fit into the great chain of cause and effect. The Kabbalion The Kabbalion defers to engage into an argument regarding free will versus determinism for many reasons. The primary reason being that neither side of this argument is entirely correct, but according to the principle of polarity, both are half true. Both are partially right according to the Hermetic teachings. They are the opposing poles, but of one truth, cause and effect. The Kabbalion puts it this way, quote, The teachings are that a man may be both free and yet bound by necessity, depending upon the meaning of the terms and the height of truth from which the matter is examined. The ancient writers express the matter thus, the further the creation is from the center, the more it is bound. The nearer the center it reaches, the nearer free it is. The Kabbalion By using law against law, it is possible to shift into higher planes, closer to the center, and exercise more free will. The majority of people are more or less slaves of the lower plane of consciousness and manifest very little freedom. They are mostly swayed by the opinions, customs, and thoughts of the outside world and their emotions, feelings, and moods. They manifest no mastery and believe that they act as they please but never understand the underlying cause of their actions. They do not understand what makes them want to do one thing instead of another, and that is because there is no because to their pleasing and wanting. The masters can change their pleases and wants into others at the opposite end of the mental pole. They are able to will to will instead of to will because of a feeling, mood, emotion, 
or emotional suggestion aroused a desire within them to do a certain thing. The majority of people are carried along like a paper boat, obedient to their environment, outside influences and internal moods, and never consider the causes of these influences. They are moved like the pawns on the chessboard of life. They play their parts and are laid aside after the game is over. But the masters know the rules of the game and are able to rise above the plane of material life, place themselves in touch with the higher powers of their nature, dominate their own moods, characters, qualities, and polarity, as well as the environment surrounding them, and they become movers in the game. In other words, they become causes and not effects. These masters aren't able to escape the law on the higher planes, but fall in line with the laws on the higher plane in order to master the circumstances of the lower. The Kabbalion reminds us that on all planes, the law is always in operation. There is no such thing as chance. Everything is governed by universal law. Quote, It is true indeed that even the hairs on our head are numbered, that not a sparrow drops unnoticed by the mind of the all. The Kabbalion. Quote, There is nothing outside the law. Nothing happens contrary to it. The hermetic teachings assert that man may use law to overcome laws and that the higher will always prevail against the lower. The Kabbalion. Take a moment and attempt to grasp the meaning of this. Chapter 13. Gender. Quote, Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. The Kabbalion. The seventh hermetic principle is the principle of gender. It embodies the truth that gender is manifested in everything, that the masculine and feminine principles are ever present and active in all phases of existence on each and every plane of life. The Kabbalion points out that gender, in the hermetic sense, and sex, in the ordinary use of the term, are not the same. Gender comes from the Latin to generate, and the law of gender is the generative or creative principle. It is not merely related to sex, but sex is a manifestation of this law on the physical plane. The Kabbalion warns against practitioners and practices which have sought to identify this principle with reprehensible sex acts and teachings regarding sex. The principle of gender is the law of creation, and its manifestations are visible in every plane of existence. Take the molecular structure of an atom with its protons and electrons. The protons are positive and the electrons negative. These elements attract one another to varying degrees and create the world around us based on their interactions. This is completely in line with the Hermetic teachings, which have always identified the masculine principle with the positive pole and the negative with the feminine pole of electricity. The terms positive and negative might have unsavory connotations in the mind of many readers, so the Kabbalion uses the terms masculine and feminine instead. The interactions of these poles are not good or bad. They are simply generative and receptive and work together in order to create in the known universe. The way these creative energies work together is that the feminine electron leaves a masculine proton and starts out on a new adventure. She actively seeks union with a new masculine proton, being urged by its natural impulse to create new forms of matter or energy. When the feminine electron unites with a masculine proton, a certain process begins. The feminine particles vibrate rapidly under the influence of the masculine energy and circle rapidly around him. The result is the birth of a new atom. The new atom is composed of a union of the masculine and feminine, but when the union is formed, the atom is a separate thing and new life has been created. The part of the masculine principle seems to be that of directing a certain inherent energy toward the feminine principle 
and catalyzing the activity of the creative process. But the feminine principle is the one always doing the creative work. This is so on all planes. Each principle is incapable of creation without the assistance of the other. Everything in the organic world manifests both genders. There is always the masculine present in the feminine form and the feminine in the masculine. The Kabbalion doesn't go into detail regarding the phenomena of attraction and repulsion of atoms, chemical affinity, or cohesion between the molecules. These facts are very well known and are explained by the principle of gender. The Hermeticists have understood it through the principle of gender for ages. Now that this law has been introduced, the Kabbalion urges us to understand how this principle operates in the mental plane. Chapter 14. Mental Gender Continuing its correspondence on into the higher planes, we see the principle of gender operate on the mental plane as the dual mind, or the principle of mental gender. The Hermetic teachers ask their students to examine their own consciousness regarding its aspects. The students are asked to turn their attention inward upon the self dwelling within each of them. Each student is led to see that their consciousness gives them a first-hand report of the existence of self. That report is I am. This at first seems to be the final words from the consciousness, but further examination uncovers the fact that this I am may be separated into two distinct parts or aspects, the I and the am or the I and the me, the observer and the participant. While looking inward, it may appear there is only an I, but upon further examination, students begin to notice the presence of an I and a me. These mental twins differ in their characteristics, but an examination of them will throw much light upon the many problems of mental influence. Let us consider the me, which is usually mistaken as the I. A person thinks of themselves as being composed of certain feelings, tastes, likes, dislikes, habits, characteristics, and so on, which all go to make up their personality or the self as is known to themselves. The individual knows that these feelings and emotions change, are born and die are subject to the principle of rhythm and polarity, which take them from one extreme of feeling to another. The person also thinks of certain knowledge present in their mind forming a part of themselves. This is the me of a person. This me can often be considered to be the identity of a person, including their style and appearance, their moods and opinions, habits, qualities, and mental baggage. Yet, these are able to be set aside as they are characteristics which are impermanent and may change at any time. This is very hard to do and takes much mental concentration, but by differentiating and laying these characteristics aside, the student may view this me and the I and find themselves in conscious possession of a full self, which may be integrated in its dual aspects. The me will be felt to be a something mental in which thoughts, ideas, emotions, feelings, and other mental states travel through. It may be considered as the mental womb, as the ancients called it, as it is capable of generating mental offspring. Its powers of creative energy are felt to be enormous but still it seems to be conscious that it must receive some form of energy from either its I companion or from some other I if it is to be able to bring about its mental creations. This consciousness brings with it a realization of an enormous capacity for mental work and creative ability. The me, being the mental womb, is receptive 
and in need of will in order to complete the creative act. The I is considered to be that masculine will that catalyzes the feminine me in order to create. This I also has the capacity to stand beside and witness the creation as an observer while projecting an energy to the me, which is the process of mental creation. The I is the observer. The me is the experiencer. This dual mind exists in every person. The I represents the masculine principle of mental gender and the me, the feminine. The I represents the aspects of being and the me represents the aspects of becoming. The I is static. The me is fleeting. These dualities of mind give the master a key to the dimly known regions of mental operation and manifestation. The principle of mental gender contains the secrets of mental influence. The tendency of the feminine principle is always in the direction of receiving impressions, while the tendency of the masculine is always in the direction of giving or expressing. The feminine conducts the work of generating new thoughts, concepts, and ideas, including the work of the imagination. The masculine provides the will in its varied phases, which might also be called intention. Without active aid of the will of the masculine, the feminine is unable to produce anything. Both elements are required for creation. People who can give continued attention and thought to a subject actively employ both of the mental principles, the feminine in the work of the imagination and the masculine will in stimulating, directing, and energizing the creative portion of the mind. The majority of persons rarely employ the masculine principle and are content to live according to the thoughts and ideas instilled into the me from the I of other people's minds. The student of Hermeticism learns to use the masculine principle of will to forge a path of their own choosing. The strongest people of the world manifest the masculine principle of will. Instead of living upon the impressions made on them by others, they dominate their own minds by their will, obtaining the kind of mental images desired, and very often, as a result, dominate the minds of others in the same manner. Look at the influential people, how they manage to implant their seed thoughts in the minds of the masses of people, thus causing them to think thoughts in accordance with the desires and will of themselves. This is why the masses of people are such sheep-like creatures, never originating an idea of their own and never using their own powers of mental activity. The manifestation of mental gender may be noticed all around us in everyday life. The magnetic people are those who are able to use the masculine principle in the way of impressing their ideas upon others. The actor who makes people cry at will is employing this principle along with a successful speaker, influencer, writer, or entrepreneur. In this principle lies the secret of personal magnetism, personal influence, fascination, and as well, the phenomena generally grouped under the name of hypnotism. With this information is presented to the student a master key that may open the many doors leading into the parts of the temple of knowledge which they may wish to explore. Quote, with the aid of the Kabbalion, one may go through any occult library anew, the old light from Egypt illuminating many dark pages and obscure subjects. That is the purpose of this book. We do not come expounding a new philosophy, but rather furnishing the outlines of a great world-old teaching, which will make clear the teaching as others, which will make clear the teachings of others which will serve as a great reconciler of differing theories and opposing doctrines. The Kabbalion. Chapter 15. Hermetic Axioms. Quote, The possession of knowledge, unless accompanied by a manifestation and expression in action, is like the hoarding of precious metals, 
a vain and foolish thing. Knowledge, like wealth, is intended for use. The law of use is universal, and he who violates it suffers by reason of his conflict with natural forces. The Kabbalion. Knowledge without use and expression is a vain thing, bringing no good to its possessor or to the race. Study the hermetic axioms, but practice them also. The hermetic teachings were never meant to be hidden. The law of use warns that the hoarding of knowledge, the intentional misuse or non-use, is a violation and will have consequences. Below are some of the more important hermetic axioms from the Kabbalion, with a few comments added to each. Make them your own and practice and use them, for they are not really your own until you have used them. Quote, to change your mood or mental state, change your vibration. The Kabbalion. One may change their mental vibrations by an effort of will in the direction of deliberately fixing the attention upon a more desirable state. Will directs the attention, and attention changes the vibration. Cultivate the art of attention by means of the will, and you will have solved the secret of the mastery of moods and mental states. Quote, to destroy an undesirable rate of mental vibration, put into operation the principle of polarity, and concentrate upon the opposite pole to that which you desire to suppress. Kill out the undesirable by changing its polarity. The Kabbalion. This is one of the most important of the Hermetic formulas. It is based upon true scientific principles. We have shown you that a mental state and its opposite were merely the two poles of one thing, and that by mental transmutation, the polarity can be reversed. You do not have to shovel or sweep out the darkness, but merely by opening up the shutters and letting in the light, the darkness will disappear. To kill out a negative quality, concentrate upon the positive pole of that same quality, and the vibrations will gradually change from negative to positive until finally you will become polarized on the positive pole instead of the negative. The reverse is also true, as many have found out to their sorrow when they have allowed themselves to vibrate too constantly on the negative pole of things. By changing your polarity, you may master your moods, change your mental states, remake your disposition, and build up character. Much of the mental mastery of the advanced hermeticists is due to this application of polarity, which is one of the important aspects of mental transmutation. Remember the hermetic axiom, which says, quote, Mind, as well as metals and elements, may be transmuted from state to state, degree to degree, condition to condition, pole to pole, vibration to vibration. The Kabbalion. The mastery of polarization is the mastery of one of the fundamental principles of alchemy. Unless one acquires the art of changing their own polarity, they will be unable to affect their environment. An understanding of this principle will enable one to change their polarity as well as that of others, but only if they devote the time, care, study, and practice necessary to master the art. The principle is true but the results obtained depend upon the practitioner. Quote, rhythm may be neutralized by an application of the art of polarization. The Kabbalion. Rhythm manifests on the mental plane as well as on the physical plane, and the bewildering fluctuations of moods, feelings, emotions, and other mental states are due to the backward and forward swing of the mental pendulum, which carries us from one extreme of feeling to the other. The Hermeticists teach the law of neutralization enables one, to a great extent, to overcome the operation of rhythm in consciousness. As we have explained, there is a higher plane of consciousness, as well as the ordinary lower plane, and the master, by rising mentally to the higher plane, causes the swing of the mental pendulum to manifest on the lower plane, and then, while dwelling in the higher plane, they escape the consequences of the swing backward. This is done by polarizing on the higher self, 
and thus raising the mental vibrations of the ego above those of the ordinary plane of consciousness. It is like rising above a thing and allowing it to pass beneath you. The advanced hermeticist polarizes themselves at the positive pole of their being, the I am pole rather than the pole of personality, and by refusing and denying the operation of rhythm, they can raise themselves above the plane of consciousness and allow the pendulum to swing back on the lower plane without changing their own polarity. This is accomplished by all individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery, whether they understand the law or not. Such persons simply refuse to allow themselves to be swung back by the pendulum of mood and emotion, and they remain polarized on the positive pole. Remember that you cannot destroy the principle of rhythm, for that it is indestructible. You simply overcome one law by counterbalancing it with another and maintain an equilibrium. Quote, Nothing escapes the principle of cause and effect, but there are many planes of causation, and one may use the laws of the higher to overcome the laws of the lower. The Kabbalion. By an understanding of the practice of polarization, the hermeticists rise to a higher plane of causation and counterbalance the laws on the lower planes of causation. By rising above the plane of ordinary causes, they become themselves causes instead of effects. By being able to master their own moods and feelings and by being able to neutralize rhythm, they are able to escape a great part of the operations of cause and effect on the ordinary plane. The masses of people are carried along, obedient to their environment, the wills and desires of others stronger than themselves, the effects of inherited tendencies, the suggestions of the media and society, and other outward causes, which move them unwillingly on the chessboard of life like pawns. By rising above these influencing causes, the advanced student seeks a higher plane of mental action. And by dominating their moods, emotions, impulses, and feelings, they create for themselves new characters, qualities, and powers, which they use to overcome their ordinary environment and become players instead of pawns. These people play the game of life understandingly instead of being influenced by others. They use the great principle of cause and effect instead of being used by it. Of course, even the highest are subject to the principle as it manifests on the higher planes, but on the lower planes of activity, they are masters instead of slaves. As the Kabbalion says, quote, The wise ones serve on the higher but rule on the lower. They obey the laws coming from above them, but on their own plane and those below them, they rule and give orders. And yet, in so doing, they form a part of the principle instead of opposing it. The wise man falls in with the law, and by understanding its movements, he operates it instead of being its blind slave. Just as does the skilled swimmer turn this way and that way, going and coming as he will, instead of being the log which is carried here or there. So is the wise man compared to the ordinary man. And yet both swimmer and log, wise man and fool, are subject to law. He who understands this is well on the road to mastery. The Kabbalion. In conclusion, let us again call your attention to the hermetic axiom, quote, true hermetic transmutation is a mental art. The Kabbalion. If the universe is mental in nature, then it follows that mental transmutation must change the conditions of the universe. If the universe is mental, then mind must be the highest power affecting it. If this can be understood, then all the so-called miracles can be seen plainly for what they are. Quote, The all is mind. The universe is mental. The Kabbalion. Epilogue, Translation of the Emerald Tablet, The Fourth Initiate. 
It is true and certain and most true that that which is below is like that which is above and that which is above is like that which is below. And as all things have been and arose from one by the meditation of one, so all things have their birth from the one. The sun is its father, the moon its mother, the wind gave birth to it, and the earth nurtures it. It is the cause of the structure of the universe. Its power is perfect on earth as it is above. Separate spirit from matter with great attention to detail. Ascend from physical to mental and unite the aspects of the whole. In so doing, you will possess the light of the world and darkness will avoid you. Its power is above all power. It will endure everything and nothing. So was the world created. Love is all there is. The End Copyright 2024 Blue Collar Mystics Audio Read by Bootsy Greenwood